interfaith relations. I want you to do a spring edition of the Festival of Faith in the days leading up to His Holiness' visit. That's a good idea, don't you think? We all kind of had these blank expressions on our face, uh, but nodded, of course, and said, uh, yes, that sounds like a very good idea. And then we scrambled um, uh, in a wild way as soon as the meeting was over and said, can we really pull this off? Well, anyway, here we are. And, and the purpose really is in our minds, and certainly uh, as the mayor said, was to not only make a big deal out of His Holiness's visit, but also to sort of prepare the ground here in Louisville for His Holiness's visit. And I can't think of a finer expression of, of the things that His Holiness is so uh, constantly talking about uh, than the group that we have uh, to address us today. They are uh, some of the most extraordinary and distinguished speakers, and I can say that because they've all been with us this week, and they have spoken to us this week, and they do not constitute our entire uh, group of speakers uh, who, who have, those that are not on the stage have also been extraordinary. Uh, all of these uh, uh, programs, by the way, are findable. We are incredibly proud to say on uh, YouTube and uh, somewhere, we'll, we'll, we'll have that, all the details on where you can find that uh, here later on. But um, in any case, that is, um, that's really the story of how, yeah, there we are, right there. Ask no more than, than ask and you get a big slide that tells you where to go. So just go there and you can see everything that we've had in our program. Um, let me just also offer um, uh, uh, some thanks. We've, uh, um, we have, um, only been able to put this on, of course, with an enormous amount of help from the city uh, uh, on, 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 on lots of different levels, and including um, a few really specific uh, uh, groups and companies that have been just incredible partners and allies to us. And um, let me say that in addition to the mayor, his entire office uh, and really the whole uh, city of Louisville uh, on the government side has just been completely supportive. Also Brown Foreman Corporation, the Archdiocese of Louisville, Louisville Public Media, the Earth and Spirit Center, Fons Vitae, Val Jones and the Whiskey Row Lofts, and Christy Brown for her ongoing and tireless support of this festival. Um, our staff, which has just been amazing, uh, led by Dr. Kathleen Lyons, uh, has uh, grown uh, in the days and weeks and months leading up to this festival, but at its core are two other people um, who later on, before we finish up, I'll make sure and bring forward so we can all applaud them uh, with them before us. But now maybe we could just offer a brief uh, uh, thanks with heartfelt enthusiasm for Sarah Reed Harris, Chris Wooten, and Kathleen Lyons for making this all possible. Okay, you want, you want, okay, so now, this is a very unusual program relative to the other ones we've had. There's lots of various moving parts, and um, blessedly, Rajiv, master of all things um, to do with moderation and beyond, of course, uh, is going to help us. So he'll explain more of these moving parts himself, but just so you know, look to him and pay close attention so as to follow <laughs> our program as it unfolds. Uh, Gray is now going to offer uh, some words of introduction. Good morning. Um, this particular event you're attending today is actually the interfaith component uh, requested by His Holiness the Dalai Lama for his visit to Louisville. That is why the wonderful scholars who are here with us today who will speak about compassion and its source in the self and how we may abide in that true self, these scholars will be uh, with His Holiness on stage, to, on stage, do you call it that? On stage, it seems odd. Um, with the Dalai Lama tomorrow, each of them making a summary of what they say today so that um, he is aware of what um, his interfaith component has done. And before we begin uh, their session today, our blessed Arja Rinpoche from Bloomington will do an introductory prayer. He is His Holiness's representative here in America. He is in charge of the Tibetan Mongolian Center in Bloomington, and therefore, after Kathleen speaks a few words, he will really inaugurate and bless the opening of the interfaith component of His Holiness's visit. Thank you.
Well, <laughs> things have to be adjusted down <laughs> for me. Um, so far in our Festival of Faiths on Sacred Silence, we have talked a great deal. And I suppose the most uh, prominent subject has been happiness. Happiness, as has been defined at this festival, is a contentment that reaches deep down into our interior to what is most admirable in our remarkable selves. This festival, I think, is one of a kind. It is our 18th Festival of Faiths, but we have not had another like it in our history. And I'm wondering, has there ever been a festival, a festival of faiths quite like the one that we have just had? Our leader for this remarkable festival of faiths is Asley Brown III. Asley, at the beginning of every single session, has thanked everyone in sight. Now that we've reached the climactic moment of the festival, it is time to thank Owsley. <laughs> you can do better than that. <laughs> Asley has led us from the front, from behind, and from every side. We are so very, very grateful. And um, uh, having said in our own feeble way, thank you for the enormity that is in our hearts. Uh, we'll continue with the festival that he has so ably led from the very beginning. Thank you, Asley. And now, I think Arjia Rinpoche is to continue. Thank you. Reme Chulu Kewang Dirzom Tu Chichin Shapten Zamling Shishing Day Pame Tokjang Marjur Semchen Kun Jibchang Chozok Samde Tundrup Sho Beautiful and shining like the white moon the sublime gift of compassion was given to me by my kind mother. Later, as I grew older, I became discontent with what I had, always searching for what I did not have, focused only on my own happiness. I became greedy. Jealousy and envy made me live it with anger. Dulled by ignorance, I cared little about others. The light became thinner and thinner, and the dark became thicker and thicker. Finally, I listened to the words of truth, spoken equally by my spiritual teachers and by great scientists, philosophers, psychologists, and faith leaders. Like a purifying wind, 
their wisdom blew the dark clouds away. We can experience great love when we exchange ourselves with others. Then we will know that my neighbor's problem is my problem. Then I will realize that your suffering is my suffering. Then the pure moon of compassion will shine clearly again. When I have uh, the opportunity to listen to the great beings express themselves, I found that they can change my life immediately. Now is your chance to listen to the eminent protectioner, uh, pra practitioners from different faith traditions and fill your life with compassion and love. Thank you. Thank you, Rinpoche. That's been a great blessing. Um, as Rinpoche just said, I would just flag and underline his comment that when you listen to great minds and evolved souls, uh, they profoundly impact us. And I feel particularly blessed and privileged to be sharing the stage with people of such eminence. I am just merely a struggling, failing aspirant, blessed to be a student of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And uh, I, I can say that uh, His Holiness would be hugely delighted and happy that uh, the, the pre-climax of the event, because I would imagine the climax is His Holiness's visit tomorrow and his public address and the teachings, uh, is this interfaith dialogue. Uh, he has uh, often said that uh, the interfaith discourse, the interfaith dialogue, but much more than dialogue, the cultivation of interfaith harmony and peace and learn mutuality and learning uh, is one of his three primary motivations. And so he would be very, very pleased. Um, just in, in terms of uh, housekeeping for the morning, uh, each speaker will, uh, each faith will be represented by a, a speaker, in the case of Hinduism, by two speakers. Uh, and, and each faith will find 20 minutes uh, to articulate their thoughts and ideas. And uh, since there are a number of speakers and a very sharp, tight schedule, I will gently, on the 20th minute to the <coughs> 19th minute, tap this signal that time is running out. And uh, that will be followed by uh, 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 a discussion between the, our speakers on the stage and with the audience. And uh, before each speaker speaks, uh, we thought that uh, a minute silence uh, so that we can have digested and processed what has preceded it. And before the first, the very first speaker of the day, uh, we will have a somewhat longer silence of uh, three minutes. <coughs> and uh, the first speaker is Matthew Ricard, and I am deeply privileged describe him as a friend and someone who I have learned much from. Uh, he's a Buddhist monk, as we can see, uh, but he's also a molecular biologist uh, by training. And he um, has lived and, and studied Buddhism for more than 40 years. He's the author of several books, The Monk and the Philosopher, uh, Happiness, A Guide to Developing Life, Most Important Skills, and Why Meditate. Several books of his photography have been published throughout the world. He's an active participant in the scientific research of the effects of meditation on the brain, working with the Mind and Life Institute. He has been a the French interpreter uh, for His Holiness for many decades. He lives in Nepal and donates all the proceeds of his books and, and conferences to Karuna Sheshan, a humanitarian organization that he founded in 2001 uh, to honor 
uh, his teacher. And one of the very familiar early images that I have of um, Matthew is, you know, with the, with the, with the wired brain cap. And that is, real, is, is an iconic image of, of Matthew. Uh, <laughs> um, so if we could just, uh, uh, you know, speakers are welcome to either go on to the lectern or to speak from where they're seated. And as has been the convention uh, during this, uh, the practice during this, uh, this, this festival of fates, uh, we will pause uh, for three minutes of uh, silence. And it starts when I gently touch this and it concludes when I touch it again. Speaking of silence, an emotionless journey, like a mute trying to explain the taste of honey. Of course, um, there are many levels to silence. There's the outer silence of physical sounds. There's the silence of not using one's speech. There's the silence of wandering thoughts and this is the silence of the ultimate nature of mind. So <coughs> we can relate that concept, although I think in Tibetan literature there's not much commentary written on silence per se, but uh, silence can be also related to simplicity and different levels of simplifying one's um, body, speech, and mind activities. So if we think of the just physical outer silence, it's certainly uh, something that is conducive to contemplative practice. Uh, I think we don't realize uh, how much noise pollution there is constantly uh, in most of those places. So try to be silent here. So many things, we get this machine going on and so many things. So when you actually go to places uh, in nature, like in the Himalayas or somewhere, when there is actually almost perfect silence, uh, it's quite amazing what any kind of sound uh, has completely different dimension. Uh, it sometimes gives rise to strange experiences. Once I was sitting early morning at 13,000 feet on the shore of Manasarovar Lake in eastern Tibet near Kailash, Mount Kailash. And uh, I heard some ducks calling. It was almost perfect silence. And I sort of looked for the ducks, just could not see them. And then really looking, looking, I saw two yellow ducks almost a kilometer away. And similarly, 
once I was in my hermitage in Nepal, and I heard some kind of uh, fire, like and when you burn dry branches, and I thought, oh, something, fire somewhere. So I just came out. It was on the other hill. Because of this perfect silence, it was like almost it was here. And the farmers there, they do speak from one hill to the next. They try to speak here, someone across the street. They won't, get, they won't hear you. But there, I mean, they don't have a real conversation, but they, they say enough that, that they can say, I'm coming, or please come, or something like that. Across the hill, about two miles. And then here, there you can, you know when the rain is coming, and we know from which direction, about a few minutes before, from the sound of the rain on the forest, would like, and it come, you know it's coming from the left or the right. And then after a few minutes, it rains. Try to hear the rain here. <laughs> I mean. So, and one night, there's a, there's a monastery on the another hill across our hermitage. It's about, I would say, two miles. For those who have seen this photo exhibition the other day, it was this monastery in the middle of the clouds. And one night, I thought, how come they're you know, beating the drums so late? Like it was 10 o'clock at night. I was, then I realized it's my blood beating in my ear. And then I had bought a clock from, from the valley of Kathmandu. And that tick, tick, which I never heard in my room in Kathmandu, became so much I had to hide it under the pillow. <laughs> so at least then there's no this kind of disturbance. So if you make noise in your mind, you are the only responsible. <laughs> so that's already a good thing. You have the perfect place, the perfect condition, for spiritual practice. So if you don't progress, you have no one else to blame. Then, of course, there's the silence of not speaking, which is one, one thing also that happens when you do retreats. And uh, there, there's quite a lot said in the Buddhist scriptures about the, the benefit, the qualities of uh, not speaking. We say, actually, the, the spiritual nerves, the nadis, uh, which just go on the tongue, are the one that agitates the mind. So if you wave your tongue, your mind gets wild. So we also say the mouth, what do we say? The mouth is the open door for, for negativity, because you say all kinds of things. You criticize, you slander, so, and, you, and you perpetuate mental confusion by this endless chatter. And if you look also in a very basic uh, Buddhist ethics, uh, there are four negative actions related to speech. One, of course, is lying. One is slander. But the third one is useless chatter. That just to waste your time, this blah, 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 which we do most of the time. And if we lose most sort of Unfortunately, so-called worldly conversation, there's so much that need, didn't need to be said, basically. So to keep silence for a while, make a vow of silence. Anyway, if you're alone in your imitation, unless you speak to yourself, uh, there's not much to speak. But still, to make this vow is sort of a powerful uh, addition to concentrating in the practice. And especially if you do, of course, in the in the course of spiritual practice, there are many kinds of techniques and practice and methods, but especially when you do something which has to do with reciting mantras, it says it's very important to keep silence and have no or other ordinary I mean, conversation with anyone. So this is one way, and for instance, my uh, great teacher, Bhikkhu Kensei Moshe, those of you who are here yesterday, I showed some portraits of him. He would do long retreat in silence, and when he needed something, he had a slate which he covered with a little oil and the hashes from the, from the earth, from where the, we cook the food, and he would write a few words with his fingernail. And sometimes it was very hard to decipher, so not to upset him, I would, would go outside and try to read together and 
and see what he was actually asking for. So there's great benefit, I think, to that. So simplifying your, your activity, simplifying your speech. But the goal of all that is, of course, to simplify your mind. And why would we want to simplify or silence the mental chatter is because it is that mental chatter that keeps delusion sort of constantly fueling delusion. One thought comes and you give birth to a second one, a third one, and soon it's filling your mind with hopes and fears, with um, all kinds of delusions that begin with a like little spark and soon it's like a forest fire. Your mind is invaded with either any of the mental toxins might have to do with repulsion, attraction, anger, jealousy, pride, craving. So it all comes from this building up of thoughts. So to silence that, of course, is not just to come to a state of stupidity, but to be able, be beneath the screen of those wandering thoughts, to see what's behind that screen, which is the luminous quality of mind, which is, of course, beyond words, beyond description, but which is the real experience of the fundamental nature of mind, that, that is freedom. Because within that sort of primordial space, then there's no way there could be hatred. There's no way there could be craving or pride. It's almost like looking at the sky and try expect to find some kind of elephant or something, this no, the sky will not lead to that. It just remains immaculate and luminous and transparent. And if sometimes we have a glimpse, even a short glimpse of that, or some blessed occasion where the spiritual practice unfolds well, and you can rest in that simplicity, it seems almost inconceivable that one's mind could be overcome by either anger, craving, or jealousy. It seems how those things could ever take birth in the mind. So sometimes we describe this simplification of the body, speech, and mind. We say that in order to not to perpetuate worldly activities when you are engaged in spiritual practice, we should be almost like a corpse lying in the cemetery. You know, they don't do much. And the speech should be like a broken lute. You can't expect much music from it. And the mind should be like a spring that has run out of water. You, you finish with those mental constructs. And it is not at all like trying to artificially block the thoughts. You can block thoughts. If they are there anyway, what can you do? They're already there, so you can prevent them from being there. But it's more like this kind of silence to take again the example of space, it's always there. And then sometime a bird will pass, and that's it. The bird doesn't change, the, no, leave no trace. The bird doesn't disturb or modify the sky. So, but main thing is usually we're distracted by the bird. So we follow the bird, and another bird comes, and thousand birds, and we're only following the birds. And we lose complete, there's so many birds that we lose track of the sky that is in which they move. So silencing is just like at dusk when the birds finally go to sleep. And there's only the beautiful sky. So it's a kind of simplification. And simplicity is a wonderful uh, concept. Because, you know, s we are not lacking anything by just remaining in this state of simplicity not fabricating concept, not superimposing, not thinking this is either beautiful or ugly, that belongs to the object, this is either desirable or undesirable. This is all fabrication. It's all superimposed. We are making it up. We just better keep silent about making all these concepts. Imagine a rose, you know, for a poet, it's a poet can go endlessly about the beauty of the rose. No, for a snail, it's like a nice salad. For a tiger, it's absolutely no interest. So, it all depends. It's all added to the, we're adding all these things. 
So to bring this kind of silence is really simplicity. And it leads to some kind of freedom that comes, sometimes we speak of renunciation, that's a term that is not always well understood. We think of renunciation as giving up all what is good in life. You know, why we should do that? If it's really good and it's really useful, then why should we give it up? But is the bird giving up its cage or is it freeing itself from the cage? So the bird is not renouncing its cage, it's just breaking out. Or if we are walking in the mountains with a rucksack and with some provisions and you find that you also, someone puts heavy stones in your rucksack and you just leave them there, you know, you're not renouncing anything. So renouncing is renouncing to the causes of suffering. So it's simplifying, it's putting to silence all the things that perpetuate suffering. So it's not at all renouncing to really what is wholesome and brings flourishing. So in that sense, silence is recognizing the, your, your true nature, free from all those fabrications. And even I think in Buddhist philosophy, we said that the ultimate truth cannot be reached by concepts. It's beyond concepts. So there's no point trying to describe it. We can just by metaphors, by sort of saying what it is not. We can, if we said like a finger pointing to the moon, and we should not look at the finger, but look at the moon. So indication, uh, invitation to direct experience of it. But again, the silence of concept, the freedom from concept. And do we do say, speak that there's many kinds of being free from concept concept of solid existence or total non-existence, concept of coming and going, and so forth. So we are full of those concepts that reify the ultimate reality and then bring us into delusion. And this is not just something intellectual because if we have this basic reification and fabrication that comes from not being silent with concepts, then the repercussion, as little by little, they will continue to build down. There will be the basic duality, then will come with feeling of a sense of a unitary, autonomous, permanent sort of self that we need to protect or to please. And then you will split between self and others, self and the rest of the world. Then attraction, repulsion, all those 84,000 mental toxin described in the scripture will come up because you simply your mind didn't know how to keep silent. So I think we're using that image of silence. We can describe the whole process of the path going from this complex, endless chatter that ends up obscuring the sky of this primordial nature to a state of utter simplicity and within that, instead of the mental toxin, what will naturally come, sometimes is kind of very sort of blissful, of course, to which we should not cling, sometimes something very luminous, to also to which we should not cling, sometimes very spacious without much concept, which also we should not cling to, but then we end up in this simplicity that is very vivid, that is very clear, and so, that's the silence. So to say more about that, I don't know where to find the words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, sh I should add in, in that, that uh, Matthew has been uh, the subject of uh, uh, scientific research. His, his brain is wired up uh, often uh, because he has done more than 10,000 hours of meditation and uh, it is from, from that kind of experience. And this figure of 10,000 was, you know, seemed like 10 years ago. So 50,000 50, now. What they call that you I don't know. That's what they say. 50,000. <laughs> you know, 10,000 You have to baseline. count and there sort of how many, let's see. So, so well, that's this, that, how many years of retreat. And so it doesn't make any sense, but uh, we, have, we have to give a number to the scientists. <laughs> But, 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 but nonetheless, so it's, it's indicative of the, 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 the degree of mind training uh, that 
Eels, his, his insights that he has so eloquently uh, shared with us. Uh, I think it's, it's also pointing to uh, an important uh, idea common to many traditions, Sufism certainly, uh, of, uh, of you know, if, if you can silence the chatter, uh, the, the, the noise inside of us, that the veils of ignorance are lifted and, and ignorance is bred of that chatter. Uh, so that that non-conceptual experience, uh, whether you call it divine, uh, or you, you label it ultimate reality, uh, is then experience. Um, I'd like to turn to, to, to Matthew, uh, because in, in the Sufi tradition, you also have Shabda, the, you know, the aspect of recitation of, of, of mantra. And so here is uh, using a, a particular sound uh, to lead us to a deeper silence. Uh, so how does, in, in, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, uh, how do we understand the workings of sacred sound? Because ultimately, they must have a place along with sacred silence. So I think from Sanskrit, uh, ma mantra uh, etymologically means what protects the mind. That's the meaning. So protecting the mind from, from delusion. So why the repetition of you know, when I did this dialogue with my father, he says, repeating something like that, that seemed the zero level of spirituality, you know, just mumbling the same thing for hours, you know. So that's being kind of cuckoo we talk. <laughs> but actually, you know, it does help to precisely uh, get rid of that mental chatter. But it's not only that, of course. Uh, we begin with a uh, impure perception of of of, rea of phenomenal world. You know, we think of uh, precisely this being very solid, this having uh, intrinsic quality. So we solidify, we reify reality, and this this attraction repulsion, and same with sounds. We we decide that some sounds are harmonious, some are discordant, and we discriminate. And then the thoughts are usually deluded thoughts. They don't they don't spring out of wisdom. So one of the purpose of the kind of practice within which mantra recitation takes place, and it's not just out of context, it's also some visualization and, and, and mental practice, is to transform that impure perception into what we call pure perception. That is to see that all forms, whatever we can name, they can be the display of the, the kind of, we speak the body aspect of the Buddha, not, not that we see little Buddhas everywhere, but it is actually of the same quality as the Buddha's body. And all sounds, no matter what, the sound of water, the sound of you know, what we call unpleasant noise, as precious being the reverberation or the resonance of mantra. So then we don't think that this sound is, oh, this is so disturbing. Uh, and there are some great uh, yogis that they said they could actually hear the sounds of mantra in the running of water and things like that, hearing the sound of the elements and so forth. And then for the mind, of course, is to realize that all thoughts as this sort of spring out of the wisdom. So in that sense, to use mantra is part of that transforming our impure perception of the phenomenal world into the primordial purity of form, sound, and thoughts. So it's, it's not just out of context. But in, in, in that process, uh, there's also the acknowledgement that the visualization of the mantra is finally a projection of our own mind. What well, actually, the, sorry, yeah. I wanted to complete that. So doing so, we are not, we're already we have an artificial perception of this world because we superimpose. So this kind of uh, practice is not making another layer of fabrication, you know, like painting everything pink and say, oh, the world is pink, so beautiful. It's actually helping us to rediscover the true nature of phenomena. Otherwise, it would be yet another layer of artificial. So because it is the case that you know, all forms are pure in the sense that they are free from the solid concept we have, they are appearing yet void. All sounds are resounding yet void of intrinsic existence. All thoughts are manifesting yet void of intrinsic existence. So it's just a, a way to helping us rediscover the true nature of things. It's not just making everything nice, you know, like a silver lining. That would be 
uh, further delusion, delusion upon delusion. <laughs> Yesterday, Swamiji, in his uh, presentation, uh, talked about uh, the practical aspect of this is our reality check is that in, 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 the, in the, the kinds of lives that we are able to lead, uh, you know, few of us are able to escape to the, to the, to the, to the, to the mountains uh, and, and, and retreat and, and to be able to hear the sound of the rain coming, uh, is that we then have to train ourselves to work with or, or to separate uh, or isolate the cacophony uh, that our everyday lives in, 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 in cities yeah. and, and, and uh, places that we live in. And so he talked about uh, how he would go near the freeway and, and train his mind to be able to first embrace and hence exclude that noise uh, so that the, the inner noise <laughs> could then begin to settle down and, and, and you could begin to look at that mindfulness uh, so what, how do you deal with when you come away from the rarefied atmosphere uh, during retreat when you've gained these profound insights and wisdoms where you're able to put that, hear that clock and put it away, but what are the sirens and the traffic outside? How do you deal with that? So the, you see a practice that would only help when you are sitting, so there's a saying mm -hmm. that it's easy to be a great meditator when you sit in the sun with your full belly. <laughs> but the meditator <laughs> is put to this on the scale when facing challenging experiences. So if it's just that you can only meditate uh, when everything is fine and then your meditation completely goes to the drain, at the moment there's something happening, then you basically you just, you're just trying to protect yourself in the cocoon of some kind of self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. So the whole point is to gain the strength. So we could say like a, a wounded deer hides in the forest, the time of healing the wounds. So the wounds are the wounds of delusion, of mental poisons. And once the, the, the deer is healed, then he can just gamble a frolic around in, in the world. And he, he, he remain, that, keep that strength. So then ideally, a great teacher, why, I mean like if I think of Kenzel and Moshe, wherever he would be, it's complete like one taste. And I've seen that on many occasions. So once, to give you a small example, we were traveling on the plane, he was invited to France, and then uh, someone next to him, he made the tea for him. And there, there was a kind of flask of this yellow thing, he thought it was cream, so he put that full in the tea. And so Kesri Moshe drank the tea, and he's doing his prayers, and then there was a few last drops, and he, he gave it to his attendant. I was on the other side. And then it looked, and he went <laughs> And he had put full pot of mustard, <laughs> so then he said, but uh, did you uh, what, what, uh, did you drink that whole thing? He says, yes, we say, oh, I thought that's what the way they do tea here. <laughs> <laughs> and one time, someone, you know, one of those, there's so many, so many people who wants to do something to those great teachers, offer them treatment, this and that. So they say they want to do moksha, you know, this heat thing, so like with the cigar, because he had some stomach digestion problems. So he was doing his prayers, bare chest, and the guy, came and started, and then he was a bit distracted, so at some point we heard, we, we, we smelled the burning smell. He had completely burned Kensal Moshe on his belly. And Kensal Moshe didn't move, so he said, how, why didn't you say anything? You know, something mm -hmm. like that. I, I was translating, and Kensal Moshe said, he was just doing his prayer. Oh, I thought that was the treatment, he said. <laughs> <laughs> so you see now, <laughs> but it's too easy to say, you know, uh, my work at the office is my meditation. I meditate in the subway, and there's no need to do formal practice. Basically, that's saying that, you know, I, I, I don't feel like to make any effort. So, but to think that we can uh, deal with all that uh, seamlessly without training is, is a bit premature. So, you know, it's like when you want to learn how to sail on a boat, you're not going to start on a day of, with a full storm. You will begin when there is fine weather, then you will know how to rig the sail and do, and then later you can navigate in the storm. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, what you acquire through the practice in silence and in beautiful and sort of secluded place, then you know it, it stays a little bit with you so that you can uh, preserve that in other conditions. So, but I think it's like exactly the experience, you know, a experience. Uh, horse rider, he will ride in very difficult terrain without falling down. 
So that is, I think, when we expose the world, we need that preliminary. Otherwise, <laughs> it's not too difficult, I guess. Well, one of the privileges of being a moderator is that you get to ask eminent, incredible, evolved souls all the questions that come up for you. And so I feel indulgent and selfish. So uh, uh, is, 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 is there anyone in, on, on the panel? Uh, would you, sir? All right. Uh, I just want to make a comment about the question of mantra. Uh, from the point of Islamic tradition, and I think also many other traditions, including Hindu tradition, uh, a mantra is not just any sound that you repeat. If I can speak in Abrahamic terms, the mantra is a sacred bark sent from the other shore of existence to us to carry us back to the other shore of existence. And it always implies the presence of the sacred itself within the sound system. There's a grace that is present, without which, no matter what you repeat all the time, is not going to get you from becoming to being to the primordial state. And the reason why always within uh, sacred formulas of mantras in different traditions, although it's a sound system, there's always the presence of a silence. The silence represents the principal reality which determines that sound system. That's what is different between, let's say, sacred music and the cacophony you heard last night, which came from hell, <laughs> I, 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 so we had to shut up the meeting quickly. Uh, there's a very, very big difference. A sacred art, not and the mandala, uh, excuse me, the mantra is the heart of it, in a sense, sacred sound uh, and art of sound. But any uh, sacred music, even, contains within itself an element of silence. The greatest uh, musical performances in India, for example, the great master succeeds, Ustadi Akbar Khan or someone like that, is when he finishes, you don't clap. There's a silence unto which the experience returns. And it's very, very important to remember that uh, mantra always contains already that silence which has sent the sound to us in order to return us back to the silent. Yes, and actually, you're perfectly right. Uh, in Buddhism as well, you know, mantra has always the name of a Absolutely. particular aspect of enlightenment. So the mantra that uh, Ajahn Mishra said the other day, Omani Padme Hong, is the speech embodiment of Avalokiteshvara, who is the Buddha of compassion. In the same way that uh, you know, a physical appearance of Buddha Shakyamuni or a statue of Buddha will symbolize the body manifestation, the Rupakaya of the Buddha. The speech will symbolize the more subtle aspect Samogakaya, and in then you cannot represent the mind, which is the Dharmakaya, or ultimate dimension. But the speech actually embodies all the, the, the power of transformation, according which is Manjushri, it would be the power of wisdom. If it's Avalokiteshvara, the power of compassion. If it's Vajrapani, it would be the power of enlightened activity. is embedded in the name and the sound. And, and then if you go into the explanation of mantras, it's very deep. You know, like you start Om Mahong, it's the enlightened body, speech, and mind that transform your, your deluded uh, body, speech, and mind. And then likewise. So every, every word has a meaning. If you have the, the word Padma in it, it represents the lotus that grows immaculate out of the mud. That means the Buddha nature that is never spoiled. And if you have Vajra, which is like the, the diamond, it means the ultimate nature it cannot be destroyed in the, in the world of illusion. And, and so forth. So it's both the name, said Padma, Vajra Padma, the name of Padma Sambhava, but it's also the ultimate meaning that is indestructible. And then at the end, you, you end up with a syllable like Hong or another one that calls for this accomplishment to actually take birth in your mind. So if you do, while you recite, also understand this, the, the meaning, then it's, uh, it opens uh, a way to further your practice. Father, what about your tradition? <laughs> you know, I think I can probably only say the obvious, but among the many uh, gifts that I think uh, what we call Eastern religions <laughs> are giving and have given to the West is this connection between the, the medium and the message. And I don't know what all the cultural factors were that 
made the West uh, do what it seemed like a nonstop flight to the, what it thought was the message. <laughs> it gave the doctrine, the dogma, the belief, the metaphysics, believe it. We tried to convince people to believe it. Um, but over the centuries, there was just a huge disconnect between the medium and the message. And uh, if you were do doing nothing else for the reform of, of our religion, then reconnecting us with what is in our tradition, but is simply not known at the common level. Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox too. Uh, I don't know what it is that made us so concerned with uh, forcing belief in, in concepts, which, which is what it became. So I, I just, I find it uh, so gratifying when you talk the way you do and help us see that how we get there is where we get. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's absolutely essential for the reform of Western Christianity. Now my job is to, as a Franciscan is to help them see it was always there, but it was the minority position. It was the alternative orthodoxy as we call it in, in Franciscanism. So um, I'm just so grateful to hear you speak uh, the way you speak. Thank you, thank you. To sort of take this perhaps a final step in the context uh, of, of, of this discussion further, about to uh, Swamiji and Didiji, uh, in, in, in the Indian tradition too, the mantra has a very sacred uh, space um, and, and, and a practice. And it, it also is a question, as Matthew was directing us towards, is to find the appropriate mantra for us as practitioners uh, in terms of what our need, uh, psychological, psycho-spiritual, whatever phrase you want to use, that a particular deity and the mantra associated with it uh, is that that connect is extremely uh, important and, 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 and perhaps and the guru plays a very important role in helping us identify this a particular practice appropriate for us. Um, so could you give us a sense of as practitioners who want to access an appropriate mantra for ourselves, how do we go about it? <laughs> That's a, that's a very large question and one that I'm afraid I can't give a <clears throat> satisfying answer to uh, 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 here in, 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 a, in, a, in a situation like this because it first it depends on the tradition that a person comes from and that's uh, sort of the first, or not, uh, not necessarily because I didn't start out in this tradition, but the tradition that one is living, the tradition one is practicing and so the practice that you take, uh, the practice that one takes, uh, the type of practice, uh, that is first determined by the thought world in which you live. Uh, if you're within the uh, Buddhist uh, 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 realm of practice and thought, then that, uh, that would be the first determining factor. Uh, one like myself in the uh, uh, Hindu realm of practice, or the Christian, or the uh, Islamic. Um, and so the determination of a, uh, of a mantra, that's a very complex, uh, complex fact. But let me, uh, there is one uh, thing that I would like to, uh, to say about that. And that is that, um, first of all, there's no one practice which is right for everyone. The practice of mantra is a widely used and a very, very efficacious uh, practice, but there's no practice which is meant for everyone. But as far as the practice of the mantra goes, it is important, as Matthew uh, uh, affirmed, and as uh, Dr. Nasser beautifully said also, that the mantra is intrinsic. What's a, what, uh, what makes a mantra? What separates a mantra from an ordinary word? Uh, mantra is a word which is intrinsically connected to spiritual reality. Whether you think of it in the Buddhist terms of an aspect of enlightenment, whether you think of it in terms of a deity, uh, but a mantra is, uh, is intrinsically connected to that which it uh, not only represents. The word cow represents the animal cow or the thought of cow. But a mantra not just represents an aspect of reality or enlightenment or divinity, but it embodies it. And so the mantras come from a, uh, are 
come from a higher state of uh, awareness, a, a, a state of spiritual awareness. They're revealed. And so you find, like in the Orthodox Christian tradition, where the name of Jesus was often used as a mantra, or the publican's prayer was used as a mantra, containing the name of Jesus, the name Jesus itself is a mantra. Why? It wasn't that Mary decided, oh, I had a wonderful Uncle Jesus, and so I want to name my child Jesus, because I was so fond of Uncle Jesus. No, the angel came and said, his name shall be Jesus. And so it was a revealed name. It was a, it was a name that, uh, that uh, came from a... Uh, a, a, a spiritual plane. So that's what makes a mantra a mantra, and that's what makes it uh, effective. And what, just one, one last thing, let me add to that to complete the thought. There was a, uh, <clears throat> a West, an American doctor some years ago who was criticizing the practice of mantra. He said that there's, there's nothing to it. If you repeat dog over and over again, it will gradually tire the mind out, the mind will become quiet. Well, no, that's not, the, uh, that's not the idea of the practice of a mantra, is just to tire the mind out by repeating dog, 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 dog. Uh, the idea of a mantra is that it awakens uh, uh, that which it represents. I think also that uh, I should point out that at, at, at the more mundane material level, uh, we, uh, people at, at my level, certainly also use uh, mantras for more practical aspirations, like um, you know the uh, the chanting of uh, the, the the Lakshmi mantra, which is a, the goddess of wealth. Uh, to you know, when I feel materially um, how do I put it challenged, uh, <laughs> or uh, you know, Lord Ganesh to overcome obstacle. And I think that much of this is circumscribed, as in the, uh, you know, as, as we learned from, from His Holiness and, and the Buddhist tradition, by our motivation. Uh, why do we seek to use mantra? Towards what end? Uh, and and there, is, uh, there is the other side of the misuse of uh, mantra. Uh, but Didiji, a final comment from you. <laughs> when, when I was a child, I, I used the mantra. And it was Om Bhur Bhuvaswa. And that was the only mantra I knew. And I think every Hindu child knows that. And um, I used it very conveniently. I used it um, at the bus stop, waiting for my bus to take me to school. So if I recited three times, a bus will come. <laughs> and I thought, before I go to sleep, I should do something. So I'd recite the mantra three times. But sometimes I'd get tired of it after reciting it twice. And I'd say, OK, mm, twice is enough. Or sometimes even one time was enough. Uh, not realizing that mantras are very powerful, because words are very powerful. Words that we speak to one another. If I speak in a calm voice and, and, and kind words, then I have the power to calm your mind down. If, if I speak to you harshly, if I speak harsh words to you, I can anger you and frustrate you. So words are very, very powerful. And um, the mantras contain names of God. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And, and that when I recite this mantra, it makes me think about uh, the Lord in the form of Krishna. And um, so mantra calms my mind down. It, it brings happiness to my mind and um, as was pointed out uh, by Swamiji that we, we could say dog 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 or we could say Krishna 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 there's a big difference I once visited a household um, and, and, and these people had a pet parrot who was uh, very talkative <laughs> and uh, so the, the parrot was saying Ram 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 and, uh, and he was saying all sorts of uh, short mantras names of God really and um, <coughs> And the parrot was so clever that if, it, now he knew the frequent visitors. So if the visitor was accustomed to greeting um, people by saying Ram Ram, the, the parrot would know this and the parrot would say Ram Ram. If, if, a, if the parrot knew that this person says uh, Hari Om, then the parrot would say Hari Om. I was a newcomer to the parrot. So uh, the parrot didn't know what to say to me. So I said Ram Ram, Hari Om, Ram Ram, Hari Om and uh, not realizing that I greet everyone by saying Radhe Radhe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if, if I take in the name of the Divine Mother, Radha. So to the parrot, the mantra means nothing. 
but to the human, that mantra means so much. When I hear Ram Ram, immediately I have this image formed in my mind of a very of God in his very gentle form, who's very compassionate with loving eyes and eyes full of love and mercy and compassion. So words are very powerful and, and mantras are extremely powerful because they work on our mind and they calm the mind down. Well, I can't help but think yeah, as to what the parrot's uh, karma must have been like <laughs> and, and, and how it sort of added up. <laughs> yes, please. But you are interested in the mantra for prosperity and wealth. <laughs> I have one that is really good. Ah. So my mantra for wealth, which I absolutely love, is repeat seven times. I need nothing, I need nothing, I need nothing. <laughs> it feels so good when you finish. I tell you, such a freedom. <laughs> uh, if I could uh, introduce now Swami Atma Rupananda. Um, and the, and um, what can I say that uh, I, I, I feel very partial uh, to Swamiji as I do to uh, Matthew uh, because my own uh, first introduction to the spiritual tradition was from Swami Ranganathananda uh, of the Ramakrishna mission and uh, what well, that's a personal story. Uh, Swami Atma Rupananda discovered the Vedanta tradition of Hinduism as a student in Sweden. He joined the order at the age of 19 and later spent many years in India engaged in monastic, scholarly, and spiritual training. He was a leading member of the Snowmass Interreligious Conference before his recent move to India and is active in interfaith issues. He is a founding member of the Spiritual Alliance convened by the Global Peace Initiative of Women and a participant in its ongoing Sufi, Yogi, and Hindu-Buddhist dialogues. Currently, he is working on a new critical ed edition of the complete works of Swami Vivekananda in 10 volumes in celebration of the 150th anniversary of his birth. Uh, Swamiji served at the Ramakrishna Mission in California and is now back uh, in, in Belurmat, which is the headquarters of the uh, order which uh, Swami Vivekananda founded. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, before Swamiji speaks, well, we'll just have a, a minute silence um, so that we can reflect on the wisdom that has preceded us. Swamiji, you have 10 minutes. Yes, yes, because we're sharing a tradition where our time will be 10 each. Uh, I'm going to speak more on the idea of self. Uh, but first, let me just say in reference to <clears throat> uh, an idea that uh, Matthew beautifully developed at the beginning of his uh, talk about uh, silence in the Himalayas, that I had the blessing of living five years. He's been for 45 years in the Himalayas, but I had the blessing of living at least five years there. And I've never experienced such physical silence as uh, I experienced there. It, it was an extraordinary thing. And so his, his the descriptions are no, no exaggeration. I've never, never experienced this, uh, the physical silence that, I, that uh, I had there. There was a bird called the bell bird that only in the evening it would make it sound. And it would be like the perfect two peals of a bell, ding dong. But it was just like a perfect peal of a bell. Uh, and uh, it would, uh, with long intervals in between. And uh, the, that uh, sound of the bird emphasized the silence so much that it made it even more quiet, just that, uh, that pure sound of the bell every, every minute or so. But as I said, I will speak more about the 
self and compassion rather than uh, uh, silence, but silence is, is, a, is inherent in the subject as I will speak of it. Uh, and why speak of the self? One reason is that in Hinduism, the very beginning from ancient times, the very beginning of the search was for who am I? Who am I? Um, uh, uh, and when we look into ourselves, we find that it is the present sense of self that we have which is the source of all of our problems. It's the source of our competition. It's the source of our exclusion of other people. I think of myself as this uh, psychophysical being uh, with, a, uh, 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 with a, a, a separation between my psychophysical being and everything around me. I'm here, you are there. And at the physical level, uh, there is the principle of exclusion that works. If I'm sitting here, you can't sit here unless you pull me out of the chair first or unless I willingly leave. And so at this level of self, uh, the, the air that I'm breathing, while I'm breathing the air, you can't breathe that same air. You breathe your air, I breathe my air, and our air circulates. But that which I'm breathing, the food that I'm eating, when I'm eating it, you can't eat it. And so this, uh, the, the sense of a self which needs uh, protecting, the sense of a self which needs sustaining, and the self which needs uh, reifying and protecting from the outer world uh, that is so strong in our present uh, experience. Uh, and so the Hindu uh, uh, tradition begins in some ways with the search for who am I? And when we look at ourselves, I'm not going to go into the whole process uh, of that uh, search because that itself would be a long, long talk. I have to have to shorten it uh, greatly, and so I'll give you the essence. The uh, ancient sages found, and we can find ourselves now, it's not a, a, a doctrine which was passed down, but a discovery, an experiment which is passed down. One of the things they discovered was, in seeking who I really am, am I really Swami Atmarupananda? Am I this body, mind, physical, psychophysical com complex? Am I, am I essentially this person with a, uh, with a personal history, etc.? cetera? Uh, am I this person with a particular gender, a particular age, etc.? cetera? Uh, they began to, or they found <clears throat> that there was a distinction in our experience between the seer and that which is seen. That is, I can see the world around me, and so I'm the observer and the world is that which is observed. I can see this physical body, and so I'm the observer of the body. I can't essentially be, I'll come back to a state of unity behind all of this, but in the, in the initial search they found that I see the world around me, I'm the perceiver, the world is the perceived. There's an essential difference between the experiencer and that which is experienced. <clears throat> I can see this body, and so the body cannot be essentially me. I can watch my thoughts. And the mind is nothing. There's not an organ called the mind which is exuding thoughts like, uh, 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 like an organ secreting uh, hormones, etc. cetera. Uh, the mind is its activity. And so I can see the mind's activity. Even the unconscious activity can gradually become conscious through meditative discipline. That's one of the things that meditation does. And so I can see the mind. I can see the body. So I can't essentially be the mind. I can't essentially be the body. And so through this process, <clears throat> they began to search, well, who am I at the root of my existence? And they found that I am the unseen seer. Now, again, I'll come to a, a point of unity in just a moment, but first let me uh, 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 say a word about that. They came to see that I am the perceiver of everything. I am awareness itself. I am the awareness in which everything is experienced. And so you find these beautiful uh, statements of uh, sages who... Uh, said, Aho aham namo mahyam daksho nasti hamat samaha. Wonderful am I. Uh, uh, salutations to myself. Uh, there is none so capable as I. That sounds like a very egotistical statement. That he says, I, ho I who hold this whole universe within my awareness without touching it with the body. That is, this whole universe, where does the universe exist? It actually exists within myself. And so then they began to find that where does this body exist? It exists within consciousness. Where does the mind exist? It exists within consciousness. Where do I see all of you? I think that I see you out there because I think that I'm essentially the body and the mind is inside and the, 
whatever we call consciousness is inside the mind. But they found no, that everything rests in consciousness. The universe itself, and I can't, because of time, develop that idea in a way, it's easy to show scientifically that this is the truth, though scientists have not, not taken to the idea. But it's easily, easy to use scientific knowledge to show that the whole universe that I perceive, I perceive within my own awareness. And that's true for all of us. And so then the unit, point of unity came when they saw that when you come to that point of awareness, there's neither I nor thou. There's neither subject nor object. There's neither see, seer nor seen. And then one comes to the point where you see that uh, th there's an underlying unity behind everything. And so that was the idea of self. Hinduism begins by who am I? Buddhism begins by the denial of uh, the idea of self. From our standpoint, the two come together experientially because the self for the Hindu is not, is, is not the sense, not even the sense of I am, not even the sense of the seer, the, the sense of self is that which is unnameable, uh, un, uh, unperceivable, uh, non-conceptual, uh, and which is non-dual, which is beyond all concept, uh, concept, beyond all word, etc. And so that is the heart of compassion. When I can begin to see that the essential being which I am, that within me which says I am, has its source in that, has its source in that awareness where the individual becomes uh, uh, becomes identified with the cosmic and the individual becomes identified with the divine. Not in the sense, not in the sense that I am God and so I can make the sun rise uh, in a different direction from the way it rose this morning, but in the sense that my essential being is one with the essential being of this universe, the wisdom, the love, which is the source of this universe. So when I can come to that, then I can begin, when I come to that understanding, uh, then I can begin to understand that my own purposes are not served by separating everyone outside of myself, by making everyone different from myself. Truth is served, love is served, happiness is served. Uh, all that we want is served by inclusion. To think that, uh, and I don't mean this as a political statement, it shouldn't be a political statement. It's very unfortunate that it has become politicized. It's a moral statement, and so it's uh, something that I'm uh, saying from a spiritual standpoint. To think that uh, 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 in a, a country as great as America, my own country, that we, would, uh, that we would think that we don't have the money, a country that's the richest country in the world, we don't have the money to educate our young people, that we have to begin to, uh, to sacrifice the education of young people. No, that's not a political statement, that's a moral statement. Politics is about how do we do it, whether it's better done through the private sector or the public sector or whatever. But this, I, I bring that up because this idea of inclusion, when I begin to see that my being is expansive, my being is containing, that my being is the, that which contains all of us, then I begin to see that, no, I have a responsibility to everyone, too. I have love for everyone. And so that's the, that's the root of compassion. We begin where we are. We begin where we are, and that is by uh, learning kindness, learning to feel for others, learning to substitute myself uh, for others. And in that way, I begin to grow in the sense that there is not this radical separation between self and other, and eventually there's the, the experience of unity. Let me say a couple of other things about that if I have, if I have a, a, a minute to do it within, and that is that if that's the truth of my being now, uh, if the truth of my being uh, uh, is that uh, a, a non-dual experience of unity with uh, the world around me and with others around me, that should be perceivable with my, within my present experience. How can I do that? One thing is, and I don't have time to develop it, so I just present it, uh, that is to begin to see that the universe arises within my awareness. Then I begin to feel a unity pervading everything. Another much easier practice, which all of us can do, is just there is a sense of unity pervading all of our present experience, which we experience right now. It's just that we don't pay attention to it. It's like wearing glasses. If you wear them for a long time, you forget that you're wearing them. Uh, Every perception we have, every thought that we have, is within a background of unity. And so if I can just sit quietly, a very simple meditation, very effective, 
difficult in the beginning to get a feeling for it, but quickly we can get a feeling for it. And just feel the sense of unity pervading all things. You can't have even the initial experience of unity, the most rudimentary experience of unity, without recognizing that unity as something holy, as something spiritual. The idea that the universe is nothing but matter, that's a conceptual idea. Matter itself is only conceptual. No one has ever seen or experienced matter. But we do have, within our own experience at present, a sense of unity pervading everything. All of the details that I see are within the field of unify, unifying existence. And if I can feel that, I begin to feel the sense of sacredness which is pervading all things. And that's the root of compassion. When I begin to feel that the other is not other, uh, the other is part of myself, part and parcel of myself, a reflection of myself, or my own, my own being. Thank you, Swamiji. Uh, Siddheshwari Devi Ji, addressed as Didi Ji. Didi is sacred sister, is the founder of the Radha Madhav Society, a non-profit charitable organization working in America, Canada, and Trinidad, functioning under the auspices of the Jagat Guru Kripalu Parishad. She works and strives to spread the deep spirit, spiritual teachings of Hinduism and dispel the myths and misconceptions related to it. An eloquent speaker, her mission is to simplify the eternal message of the Vedas and the Shastras and awaken love for God within the hearts of seeking souls. We'll just pause for 30 seconds of, of reflection before Devi Ji speaks. Hinduism values renunciation very much, and many Hindus uh, take pride in, in, in the fact that some distant relative or a close relative uh, has renounced the world and has joined a monastery. And it's a, it's a sense of, they, they look upon a sannyasi, someone who has renounced the world, uh, with awe and, and wonder. Of course, the sannyasi looks upon the householder with awe and, and wonder also, because the sannyasi has chosen the easier path. The householder thinks the sannyasi has chosen a difficult path. The sannyasi, the renunciate, thinks the householder has chosen a more difficult path. When I was quite a bit younger, I was in Vrindavan, the sacred land of Lord Krishna in, in India. That is where he uh, descended, and this is, that is where he performed his sweet leelas or pastimes. I was in our, uh, one of our ashrams in India, and I was standing outside, and I saw a young couple who had just gotten married. And I overheard the young man say something to his bride, and, and what he said was, uh, he spoke in Hindi, and he said, Bechari ke upar kya bita hoga? He looked at me, and obviously I'm wearing these saffron robes, and uh, he thought, he said to his wife, poor thing, look at her, poor thing. Uh, I wonder what happened to her in life that she chose this life. <laughs> and that made me chuckle, because what I was thinking um, was, at, exactly at that point, what I was thinking is, oh, poor things, they actually chose the more difficult path. <laughs> <laughs> Our path is the same, um, as Swamiji said, who am I, and, and I will say uh, more uh, further, uh, what do I want in life, and, and how will I attain it? These are the, the three questions uh, for the sannyasi as well as for uh, someone living the householder's life. But the sannyasi has chosen an, an easier path because he or she is not, uh, does not have to go to work um, that uh, sannyasi does not have to attend um, 
parties and, uh, and other such functions. And so he's able to retreat in silence. The householder has to figure out the answers and gain the answers to who am I, what do I want in life, and how will I reach it. While living um, a worldly life, while going um, and, and doing work outside the house and inside the house, it's more difficult to retreat in silence when you have so many, when you have the mortgage uh, payments to make and when you have to deal with coworkers and the boss and you have to run a business and you, you have to be out there in the world and, and doing worldly duties. But the aim of, of, of both is really the same, to, to retreat in silence and to retreat from, from Maya. And, and while living in the world, the, the aim is to, to discover the divine who, who has concealed himself in, in this world and who is all pervading. So the sannyasi now has an opportunity more uh, of an opportunity, a renunciate has more of an opportunity to retreat in silence because there are not so many demands made on him. And, and he has an opportunity to become more compassionate because he chose not to be married, he, he chose to remain celibate, he chose not to get into the worldly life, uh, the family life, I should say. Now his affection and his love are not restricted to just a few people, but now he can think about the welfare of, of, of many people. And if he's very elevated, he, he can think about, and when he becomes God-realized, when he becomes a realized soul, now his compassion, he becomes so compassionate that he thinks about the welfare of the entire world. And in one of the Hindu scriptures called the Ram Charit Manas, it is said, Sant Hridaya Navneet Samana Kaha kavin pe kaha na ana Nij pari taap dravai navanita Par dukh dravai susant punita Meaning, some poets have said that the, the saint's heart, by saint I mean someone who has realized God, one who is experiencing the omnipresence of God and not just talking about it, not just hearing about it, not just reading about it, but he's experiencing the omnipresence of God, that saint, that realized soul, his heart is as soft as butter. But the saint who wrote the scripture that I just quoted from, Saint, saint Tulsidas, he says, but I don't agree with that. I say that the saint's heart is infinitely softer than butter. Because butter melts due to its own sorrow. You put butter in a skillet, and you light the fire, you light the stove, and put the skillet on the stove. Now the butter starts melting because of the heat that it's experiencing. So the saint said this, this, the butter is melting due to its own sorrow, but the heart of a saint melts looking at the sorrows of others. Par dukh dukh, sukh sukh dekhe par. When he sees the suffering of others, he suffers as, as if he were suffering himself. And when he sees the happiness of others, he feels very, very joyful. He feels very happy. So seeing the misery of others, he feels miserable. He feels the pain of others. And seeing the happiness of others, he becomes very happy. And he wishes them more and more success and more and more happiness. He has true compassion because his vision is now universal. And his good wishes extend not only to just the extended family at the end, in the, in the beginning of his day and at the end of the night, he does before going to sleep. And upon waking in the morning, he does not say, oh Lord, help my family members, please keep my children safe. His good wishes are, they extend to the entire world and in the, in the entire universe, and countless universes. There is a, a wonderful story that my guru told about uh, compassion, learning compassion. There once lived a king, and he had a, a son, the, the prince, and as kings would do often, the, he sent his son to the gurukul, the hermitage of the guru, to learn. And the prince was a very bright young man, and, and he learned many, many lessons from the guru. And the king would come in and visit his son and, and his guru, of course. 
And the king asked one day, Guruji, is my son ready now? And the guru said, well, I've got to teach him one more lesson, that's it, and he's done. The king asked, may I audit this class? May I sit in? And the guru said, yes, of course. So now the final lesson was this. The guru did not speak a word. He just took a whip and he started beating the prince. He gave him one lash, two lashes, five lashes. The king cried out, Guruji, why are you beating my son? What did he do? The guru said, you're only auditing this class. Be quiet. <laughs> Don't ask me questions. Don't disturb my class. So then after a while, the guru stopped beating the, the prince and the prince had been crying in pain all this time. And the king said, Guruji, please, no offense, but what was this lesson all about? You were just beating my son. The guru said, one day your son is going to become the king. He's the heir to the throne. And one day he'll become the king and he will have to perform many duties. One of those du duties would be to punish the wrongdoer. Now, um, a case would come in front of him. This man has stolen that man's goat. And, and what is the punishment? And he may say, give him 50 lashes. I want him to know the pain of 50 lashes. <laughs> what it feels like. I want him to know the pain that the 50 lashes will bring to a person. I want him to be a just king, a compassionate king. And this is why this lesson was so important. Hindu scriptures say that someone who has realized God is completely compassionate. But we who have not yet reached that exalted state, what are we to do then? How are we to become more compassionate? How do we become more compassionate? Regarding this, and, and I speak from the tradition of bhakti, uh, the tradition of devotion. So regarding this, the, there are two practices. One is called karm sannyas, the other is called karm yog. Karm meaning actions, duties, responsibilities, and sannyas meaning renunciation. So one practice is that you renounce that, even if you're not a sannyasi, even if you have not renounced the world, but you sit at home, uh, preferably early in the morning, and you retreat from the world and, and you remain you retreat into silence, which is within. But you use words. You use mantras and you use kirtans. You use the names of God. You use the glory of God. You use sweet words, which will affect your mind very positively, which will bring the mind to a higher consciousness. And you take yourself away. Take your mind away from maya and, and towards God. And God is all compassionate. God is infinitely compassionate. And when, when you think about God, when you focus the mind on God, then God enters the mind along with all his qualities, including compassion. And you become more compassionate, you become more loving, you become more understanding. It's a very practical method, which is common to all religions. And then the other practice is karm yoga. Now, you can't stay in your prayer room or in, in a part of the house where you can get some privacy. Now you have to do your household chores, you have to go to your job, workplace, you have to run a business, etc. Now what do you do? Now karm yog. You're driving to your office, you're driving to work, and the car in front of you is really, the, the driver is, is frustrating you because he's going too slow, or he, he is um, just going here and there, and, and, and you're becoming frustrated. Now you need to have compassion for this person, whoever it is. And so now you think, it is my Lord who is driving that car. And then you say, my Lord, take your time. <laughs> you're driving slowly, you're very, very safe, and, and that's a good lesson for me to learn. So please, uh, continue going slowly. You go to your work, and, and the boss is there, and, and the boss is not very kind, he speaks harsh words, but then, be compassionate towards that boss because God is within him and you actually visualize God to be standing right there. And, and, and he's smiling at you and then you say, my Lord, you are testing me through this person, through my boss. 
and you dwell within him and, and the Lord then merges within the boss and you say, my Lord, you are within my boss. And then again, our consciousness changes and we become more compassionate and we start thinking, what kind of a day did he have? What is going on with his family? Uh, something is wrong and, 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 and I should be compassionate. I should understand what he's going through. So e even while living in the world, we can learn to be more compassionate. And there are these two practices. One is to retreat in silence, away from family members, away from the cell phone, uh, away from the iPhone, away from the iPad and the iPod, away from all these distractions that, that take us away um, from, from the Supreme. And, and just retreat in silence and, and use divine words, use sacred words to, to, re to raise uh, consciousness and then go out in the world, but remind yourself that God is always there. I had a very profound experience in Oklahoma City once. Uh, I was taking my afternoon nap, and as soon as I got up, I got up because of the ringing of the phone, and in that split second, something spoke to me, and, and what I understood was that when the phone rings, think it's, it's God calling you. When the doorbell rings, think it's the Lord who's at the door. Think of God in all circumstances. Use every excuse to think of the Supreme because we know in, in theory that he is everywhere and he's within us and he is within that person and within that person. But from a very practical point of view, how do I realize that? It's by thinking of him and actually visualizing him in every tree, in every plant, in every near, uh, near every body of water, and in the house, in my room, in the kitchen, not only in the prayer room, but in the kitchen, in the living room, in the dining room, in the bedroom. He is everywhere, and he is all compassionate. He's all merciful, and I should also strive to be more compassionate, and in, in these two through these two very powerful practices, and I speak from experience, I, I am an aspirant. I, 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 am trying to, I am trying to become a lover of God. And uh, so I can share with you that these two practices have helped me greatly. Um, they've helped me tremendously in, in becoming a, a more compassionate person. I can see, I can feel the pain of others much more than I did before. And I, must, I will conclude by saying, that in my personal case, that my guru has been so, uh, so instrumental in, in teaching me compassion and in, in, indeed in, in teaching me what compassion is in the first place, that it's not pity, that it is realizing that God dwells within every living creature, not just in every human, but in every living creature. Now my guru is a very, very uh, important personality, but he has never made himself he has never shown that to the world. He is, uh, the, the, he's been acknowledged as the, the top most authority on the scriptures, but he does not, he doesn't show that. When, you, when I saw him for the first time, I thought that he would look down upon the rest and he would make us feel very, very worldly. He would make me feel very worldly. But what he did was to simply give me an embrace. And what he said was, I've been waiting for you for such a long time and you are finally here. And he, he shed tears. And from that moment, I started understanding what true love is and what true compassion is. So in my life, I've, I'm blessed with the presence of a truly holy, holy man who is extremely compassionate and, and most loving. Thank you. Thank you, Didiji. Um, In the, in, the, in, in the Hindu tradition, we've just heard of the enormous significance of renunciation and so much that even in the life of a householder, uh, there are three stages, you know, the stage of the student, the stage of the, where he fulfills his obligations and, and duties and experiences as a householder, and then the final stage, the third act, is that of a renunciate in, in, in either case. Um, 
But there was uh, a, uh, what, what has emerged in, in, in the articulations of the idea of the self, and if you watched uh, the wonderful session yesterday morning, that the, the manner in which scientific, modern, contemporary scientific research is demonstrating that the more we are able to diminish our sense of the self, of the I, uh, the happier we are. And uh, the traditional practices uh, are really is aiming to achieve that, whether it is the journey of bhakti, uh, of, 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 of jnana yoga, of contemplation, of uh, the karma yoga that, uh, that she, she mentioned. The karma is really the way of, of action, of, of a proactive engaging in the world without attaching oneself to the fruits of one's actions. Uh, the path of the mind, uh, of the intellectual engaging, and, and, and the path of, well, shall we say, psychic practice, or the Raj Yoga, which is more um, uh, the, the engaging in, 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 the, in the specific techniques and practices of mind training uh, that can bring about that insight. But I, I, if I could turn to uh, about, uh, uh, you know, Father, uh, you know, this, this aspect of who am I, and how that I merges in a sense or softens uh, as it merges with the larger divinity or, or the, the image in, from Sufism of you know, the cup of uh, you know, consciousness which defines the individual, Jung, the larger universal, you know, the, the collective subconscious. Uh, so in, in each of these, there is this element of softening of the I. Uh, could you share that with us and, and have that? Well, yeah, yes. I will just quote two points for you uh, to show you how universal the question, who am I, that Sri Ramana Maharshi made famous in the 21st century, mm -hmm. is to all religions. Uh, the great uh, Sufi of the fourth Islamic century, the 10th, 11th century, Mansur Hallaj, who was made very famous in the West by the works of Louis Massignon, and many people have defined Sufism through his eyes in the West, uh, has a poem that we do for mission. I'll quote it in Arabic because no Arabic has been mentioned here in these few days. It says, Ra'aytu Rabbi bi'ayn qalbi faqultu man anta faqala anta. I saw God with the eye of my heart. I asked him, who art thou? He said, thou. This answer, who am I? Exactly yeah, what yeah. you said. Yeah. It's one of the most famous Arabic poems. And then the great uh, philosopher and Sufi Sohrawardi said, if you want to discover who you are, you must remember you are not I, you are not you, you are not thou, you are not he, you are not she, you are not it, you are not we, you are not you in the plural, and you are not them. Uh, yes. Once you meditate that your real you is not related to any of the pronouns with which you identify all, all identities, you'll find out who, I, who you are. I think you just meditate at these two points, you will see how universal the question you ask is in various traditions. Well, particularly the, the practice that you mentioned that I am not this is the neti, neti, neti in, our, in, in the Vedanta tradition. Yes. A very right. similar, if not identical, practice. Father. <laughs> you know, if there's any one thing that has in my opinion, anesthetized uh, the transformative power of, of Christianity. It's been the over-exaggeration of the individual. Uh, we have the doctrine of the body of Christ, the communion of saints, uh, the classic description of the whole journey was the purgative way, the illuminative way, the unitive way. But the vast majority of Christians never got to the unitive way. It was simply, simply this endless moralistic purging of the, the early path, <laughs> which uh, then we became preoccupied with our unworthiness. As it, so we paid a big price for this exaggerated individualism. It was never good enough, moral enough, holy enough, worthy enough. And so you see the preoccupation with shame and guilt and sin. Uh, which, of course, that, that's the price you pay for. If, if this little thing here has to carry the whole burden, <laughs> uh, it's going to feel inadequate. 
And, and when you don't lead people to the, the, at least the illuminative, but hopefully the unitive path, which you described so beautifully, I think, I think compassion toward the self even becomes impossible. <laughs> uh, much less were we capable of love of the enemy or the outsider, our compassion toward the poor, the, those on the edge. So uh, I think what you're describing for us is just, again, as I said before, we had it, but it never reached the common Christian uh, to, to uh, realize that they were capable of unitive consciousness. Uh, I, in my book, Naked Now, uh, used the word non-dual, and I wrote that book with some trepidation because I thought, oh, yeah, all these Western Christians are going to think, oh, he's Buddhist now or he's Hindu now, as if that's bad, of course. But, <laughs> uh, but um, I, I want to say, uh, three years later, uh, I've received almost no pushback on that. Oh, it's good. almost good. like... Oh, uh, the Western mind is finally ready to recognize that the name of contemplation is non-dual consciousness. <laughs> it's just about as simple a description as you can get. And uh, I don't know why it took us so long to get there, except this exaggerated individualism, which is incapable of unitive consciousness with itself, with the neighbor, and with God himself, herself. <laughs> So we paid a big price for uh, not listening to the other hemisphere of our brain, which is what I love to call the Eastern world. You know? <laughs> yeah. Swamiji. I'd just like to uh, uh, remark on that, uh, that um, as uh, Father Richard well knows, um, when you read the, uh, the Christian mystics, it's uh, amazing, the, 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 the experiences, the, the depth of experience, the depth of that non-dual experience that they had, uh, many, many, not just one or two. I mean, it's easy to point to one like Meister Eckhart, uh, but the, uh, he was not alone. There were so many uh, Christian mystics who had uh, profound uh, uh, depths of uh, uh, this uh, 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 trans uh, transcendent uh, uh, experience, which is also imminent as well as transcendent. That is, the, the, the transcendent doesn't mean off there somewhere, but that which is experienced right here. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the non-dual beyond the uh, beyond the distinction of I and thou. Uh, this uh, the Saint Teresa of Avila. She talks and uh, speaks in uh, the experience of unity, where she said, "There's a room with two windows, and light coming from this window, and light coming from that window. But inside the room, you can't say, well, this speck of light is from that window, and this speck of light is from uh, from that window. There's just uh, just uh, light." I'd like to just ask Father Richard one question. Um, when, you, when Swamiji mentioned St. Teresa of Avila and, and, and then St. John of the Cross, um, such saints loved, um, they, they thought of the divine as a beloved. And, Ooh, and um, yeah. that did not get, uh, how is that perceived in, in Catholicism? It's amazing how many of our mystics did uh, uh, resort to erotic, bridal language uh, as the only language adequate as did the Sufis, too, uh, to describe what was going on between God and the soul. But again, that became something for esoterics. Uh, the normal Catholic in the corner parish uh, never was told that or invited into that, as if this was only for Teresa and John of the Cross. So what a disservice we did to the West. And that goes back to Jesus himself, who Jesus' most common metaphor for eternity is the wedding banquet, <laughs> yeah, yeah. again and again. And he even calls himself the groom. <laughs> so it's founded in Jesus, but we juridicized, I don't know what other word to use, <laughs> much of the spiritual journey. It was presented in juridical terms um, instead of bridal, wedding, erotic. Uh, we have the Song of Songs in the Hebrew Scriptures, beautifully included in the in the what we once called the Old Testament but now we know it's not old it's still ours uh, but even with that kind of inclusion it's just it makes you want to weep that we didn't give the best to most of our people we really didn't 
What would that best have been? Could you articulate that briefly for us? Well, uh, it's, it's what you're all saying already, this, this sense of what we call the good news, that, that God is for us more than we're for ourselves. that God is my deepest me is God, as St. Catherine of Genoa yeah, loved to yeah. say. My, they said she used to run through the streets of Genoa shouting it like a crazy lady. My deepest me is God. My deepest me is God. But we didn't emphasize or, or even teach that unitive, delightful communion. Instead, it was what I call carrot on the stick theology. In, in Catholic form, in Protestant form, it was always God just, you know, attend a few more church services or obey a few more commandments. And one day, maybe, perhaps, but probably not, you'll get. <laughs> You'll get there. And, and so the, the vast majority of Christians became cynical about themselves or about their own possibility because the engine was not within. Uh, it was a performance contest without. So that was supposed to be the good news, which we called the gospel. You know? But uh, I'm afraid we, the good news was just too good. <laughs> and, uh, and so we didn't, we didn't offer our people the good news, you know, and people who did give it to us in different language, we called them, you know, Eastern religions or <laughs> pagans or something, uh, when uh, they were describing that same wedding banquet as all three of you so beautifully have, and I know the Sufis do. Uh, so, anyway. <laughs> May, as a Muslim brother, add, since he's a Franciscan, one of the reasons is precisely the eclipse of Franciscan spirituality, which took place at the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance. The Franciscans always carried the torch as much as they could, but they were eclipsed so much in the Catholic Church. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I think yeah, well, that we have the whole legend of Rumi and Francis meeting yes. one another in a bar in Turkey. <laughs> 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 they were partial contemporaries. Whether it happened, we don't know, but it's a perfect story. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a thought for the next festival of space. <laughs> Non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Served <I> in India. <laughs> <laughs> there really is a story. Pardon me? <laughs> there really is a story about St. Francis and Rumi. And Rumi, yes. yes. On his way to Egypt, that he stopped in Turkey, and uh, they met in a bar in Konya. Yeah, we tell it. Uh, again, we, can't, we can't prove it. But, you know, the very word Sufi means woolen which is what our habit was, too, at that time. You know? And also your yeah. hood. Yeah. It's the Jalaba. Look at the, the yeah. Moroccan here. I was once a, a young man participating in the first conference held at the Second World War on Christian-Muslim relations in Tumblilin, in Morocco. And with a Franciscan priest, a friend of mine, we decided to go down to the Sahara. And I was wearing complete uh, Islamic dress, the Jalaba. And we came to the Franciscan monastery. We went in, and it was my big picture, but in the papers, in the back of the door. And he thought, the, the priest thought I was a Franciscan. As soon as this guy was a Muslim, he tore down the picture. That was the end of it, but we're brothers. Sorry. We're Franciscans. <laughs> well, I have to press the, the pause button uh, for a, a, a 20 minute break, but I, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, we, we celebrate you, Father, for your, for your enormous candor. And, and an acknowledgement uh, of the, the predicaments that you see around Christianity. And as someone who lives in, in India, the, sort of a, a melting pot of many tr Eastern traditions and, and Christianity and Western traditions too, that I, I'm not sure that, 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 that we, and, 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 and I'm nowhere near the, that league, uh, accurately uh, present uh, you know, the, 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 the reality of uh, the way in which Eastern traditions are progressively expressing and manifesting themselves. And then we have the extreme right wing, the RSS, the BJP, we have uh, in, in the Islamic traditions, 
uh, you know, with, with people like Dr. Nasser are not willing, will not acknowledge as, 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 as true followers of the faith. I do acknowledge it, I criticize it. <laughs> and I so, don't acknowledge um, it as being Muslim, which is quite, quite something else. So I think that uh, uh, you know, it, it is a common predicament, and I, I think we have much to learn from your candor, and perhaps we too need to introspect on, on the ways in which our own traditions are being subverted and diluted. So thank you very much. Uh, this will be a break for uh, 20 minutes, uh, if that is possible, uh, for everybody to leave and come back. But, 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 we have to have our two minutes. Yes, you can see yes. how I calibrated, 30 seconds, <coughs> two minutes, so we'll make this two minutes. Well, that was a lesson, and despite the external silence, uh, how slow two minutes move when you're craving coffee or the restroom. <laughs>